Thessalonians, this letter, this small letter to the people of Thessalonica. And so I would invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 13 to 18, and, uh, and look, with this, look at this passage uh, with me. Uh, Gwyneth reminded me, I, have, I had no idea, I, could, I did not remember this at all, but apparently this was the first message that I ever preached publicly was on this passage. It was at Grace Christian Reformed Church in Coburg. Uh, the pastor who was there at the time uh, was very gracious and supportive and invited me to preach there. Um, and I happened to have also a translation assignment for my Greek class. And I had translated this passage from Greek into English. Uh, I did not bring with me the Daniel Standard translation uh, for you to read this morning, although I do have that, um, but uh, we will look at the New International Version. Um, but this passage is, is just such a passage of hope, and, and so we'll talk a little bit about why Paul delivers this, this, this statement to the people of Thessalonia, um, Thessalonica, and, uh, and what it means for us and the world around us today. But in the meantime, let us hear what the scriptures say. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, Pete, I'm going to ask you to just keep that passage, the first slide, open for a little while because there are some things we need to unpack there. First of all, the context. Um, Paul was visiting um, the city of Thessalonica. He shared the gospel there, um, and, and we talked about how he had shared that uh, you know, that gospel uh, coming off of the heels of some pretty bad uh, treatment that he had received in the last place he had been. Uh, but it's also true that Paul was only able to stay there in Thessalonica for a very short period of time. He was able to uh, be there long enough to share with them the gospel and to, uh, and to receive many who, who came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, uh, Gentiles, um, most of them who were Gentiles, that is, not Jewish already. Um, and so he was able to share the gospel with them, but he left. And, and so they were left with the bare bones, the basics of the gospel, but not with the whole meat of the thing. And so Paul writes to them um, as soon as he can afterwards to share with them words of encouragement and to teach them a bit more about this gospel that they have now believed. And so the, a large portion of the, the letter of, of 1 Thessalonians is encouragement and some instruction but also praise for them because they have already, in their brief time, they have persevered on some, under some pretty tough circumstances. We don't know all the details about that, but um, Thessaloni Thessalonica was apparently a, a bit of a, a rough place for these new Christians to be starting their journey in. And so Paul... Uh, 
they don't know exactly what this gospel, the Thessalonians don't know exactly what this gospel means for them and their future, their future even beyond death. And so Paul wants to make clear to them the hope that they have, not only for this present day, because there is tremendous hope for uh, people who believe the gospel for here and now, but also their hope for the future. Now, this passage has been involved in, in uh, debate and controversy among Christians for many, many years, and we'll get into that in, in a moment. But the first thing that we need to notice is that Paul says in here that he doesn't want them to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, those who have passed away, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. Now, that is really, really key. It's really important because there have been times when Christians have misinterpreted this to, to indicate that almost you should not grieve at all, that grieving at all for a Christ follower is somehow sinful or unfaithful. You should not grieve at all. But that is a misinterpretation of this. Paul is saying you should not grieve like the rest of mankind. In other words, grieve, but grieve with hope. You notice that? Do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Go ahead and grieve. It is natural and good to be sad about missing your loved ones who have passed away. It would be unnatural to say, oh yeah, I don't care, <laughs> whatever. I'm not going to see my spouse, my kid, my parent, my whatever, for who knows how many years, but I don't care. I'm fine. No, no, no. It's okay to grieve. It's good to grieve. Goodness sakes, you know, when your son or daughter goes away to university or college for the first time, there's some grieving, right? I hope, right? I know there has been for me. Kieran came back for the weekend. Yay! <laughs> right? There, there's some grieving there when we are going to be separated. That's natural and good, right? Right? But Paul says, don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You see, for the rest of humankind, right, who do not know Jesus, who do not know his saving power, who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior, right, they have no hope. Those who, de those who die are just dead. There is nothing more for them as far as they know. And so their grieving is not just a grieving of, oh, we're going to be separated for a while. It is a grieving of, oh, we are never going to see that person again. And there is not only no hope for them and for us being reunited, there is also no hope for me. And that is truly a terrible thing. You'll notice at the very end of this passage, Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And this is true for us as well. This whole passage is about encouraging each other, but it is also encouraging for the world around us. For those who do not have hope. And so regardless of what else you take from this message, take hope. That no matter what bad things happen in this world, we have great hope. Why do we have great hope? Paul says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And you may think, well, what's, how's, what's the logic there? I mean, Jesus is the Son of God, so of course he rose again, but what does that have to do with us? Well, it has everything to do with us, because Paul and the other biblical writers make it very clear that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. 
that Jesus is the first fruits of what we will be. And this is strange, but it is tremendous and important. You see, Jesus, who is fully human and fully divine, he rises from the dead on the third day, and he appears to his apostles and to other disciples, and we are told that he is the first fruits. He is what we will be like when we too are raised from the dead. Because Jesus didn't just conquer sin and death for himself, but he conquered sin and death for us and for the Thessalonians. And so Paul is th saying to them, look, this is why you need to have that hope, because this is not the end. Jesus, the gospel you've believed in, is the one who conquers sin and death, and so you're not going to stay dead forever. That's not the end. You are going to be raised just like Jesus has been raised. Verse 15, according to, next slide. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that those who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul's saying they're not just going to be left in their graves forever, right? You know, now, there's some controversy here, too, among Christians over the decades, because it sounds like Paul is anticipating that um, he and or people of his generation could well be alive when Jesus returns. And, and of course, that did not happen. Jesus did not return during Paul's lifetime or during the lifetime of any of the people who were alive during Paul's writing of this letter. Or indeed, you know, Jesus has not returned since then for, you know, almost 2,000 years. And so there are those who would claim, see, look, this whole gospel of Jesus, resurrection of the dead thing is false. Because Paul believed this, and supposedly he was inspired by God, and so therefore, if he was inspired of, by God, he would know whether or not Jesus was going to return during his lifetime. And since he didn't, it's all a whole uh, big crock, and it's just malarkey, right? But, but that's not what Paul is claiming here. Now, Paul is very aware that Jesus could return any time. Jesus could return during Paul's lifetime. And certainly Paul and the other apostles saw many signs that would indicate to them that the end was coming near. Many of the, many of the signs and, and symbols that we read about in the book of Revelation, for example, could have been seen to be occurring when when Paul and the other apostles were alive. Many Christians thought that the Emperor Nero, for example, was the Antichrist. And certainly he did terrible, terrible things. And many of the Roman emperors that came after him, Christians thought that they were also Antichrists. And the reality is, is that they may have been Antichrists in the small a antichrist sort of manner, right? But just because Jesus did not come then does not mean he won't come. It just means, and Paul never said that he would come then, it just means that God's timing is different than ours, which is fully and totally recognized within the scriptures. In the fullness of time, Jesus will return again. And Paul says, look, when Jesus returns again, it won't be like God leaves the people who are in the grave to languish there for a long time and we get to go to heaven and, and all that kind of stuff. No. He's saying, look, God's not going to leave them there. They will be raised up before even we are brought to be with Jesus. For the Lord 
himself will come down from heaven. And this is, this is where we get more controversy because there have been Christians throughout the ages who have believed in a rapture, the rapture which is the meeting up of God in the air, or Jesus in the air with, with human beings uh, like us believers who may be alive at the time of Jesus' return. Uh, Christians have believed in that, but they put that in a certain framework of timeline that meant that other Christians reacted against that and said, no, no, there's no such thing. That's not the way it's going to happen. Ugh. Okay. So this is where we get into all kinds of theology of the end times, the revelation. There are some people who believe, and, and they're called dispensationalists uh, and premillennials, and that's okay. They believe that the, the whole timeline of humanity is divided up into different dispensations, different eras in which God works in different ways. And that what will happen is that there will come a time when there will be um, there will be a rapture, like described here, where Christians will be called up to meet God in heaven. They will be removed from the earth, and they will be away from the earth um, during a, a tribulation period, and then Christ will return and establish a um, an in-person reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years, and then there will be a battle of Armageddon, and so on. Okay? That is one view of how it's going to work out in the end. That's not the traditional view of our denomination generally, though we don't officially say one way or another. The other view is that you know, whatever trials and tribulations this world goes through, we will all go through them, Christians and non-Christians alike. And this rapture that Paul is talking about will occur when Jesus returns once and for all to judge the living and the dead and to make creation all new. Now, that's a lot, and there's a lot more we could talk about there. However, the key point is that regardless of which, which theology you take about the end times, either way, the rapture is a real thing. The rapture is a real thing wherein Christ will return with a loud call or a trumpet blast, and we who are Christ followers, regardless of what we've been through, somehow, we will be irresistibly called up to meet Christ in the air. Like a, like a triumphal entry except on a cosmic scale. Where we will, we will irresistibly, like we'll fly. <laughs> right? We'll fly and it will not be something full of fear or whatever except for the awe of God. But it will be something incredible where we welcome our king much like the, the Israelites welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem during the triumphal entry. We will be called up into heaven. We will be called to meet him in the air and shout and praise God with him. And the dead in Christ will rise. This call, remember when Jesus says to the Pharisees that, that he tells them the truth, that if the, the children and the people remain silent, the rocks themselves will cry out, that they will pray. This is what's going on here, is that God's command, God's trumpet call is so powerful and irresistible and wonderful and delightful that we will be enabled, we will be, we'll be compelled to answer that call even in spite of our inabilities. We will be able to be doing things that, that are impossible. Things like flying or coming up from the dead, being raised from the dead. When God calls, when God calls, people answer. Everything answers. Think about creation. 
God says, let there be light. And his voice is so irresistible that there is light. The light has no choice but to exist. Right? And so the command will come and we will meet Christ in the air and the dead in Christ will rise. Next slide. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And this is part of the amazing thing. We will be with the Lord forever. And and the Bible tells us in, in, in Revelation that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. God will recreate this heaven and this new earth. And the new Jerusalem, which is symbolic of us, the church, the bride of Christ, the Bible says that that new Jerusalem will descend out of heaven. You can read about this in the end of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. The new Jerusalem will descend out of heaven dressed as a bride for her groom. And the dwelling of God will be with man. And we will live on a new heaven and a new earth that are connected together so that our spiritual reality, our our spirits which are somehow, and this is complicated, I don't get it, but somehow we are already living with God in our spirits, Somehow, those two realities of heaven and earth will be joined together and we will live with God on a recreated, perfect earth with no sin and no sorrow and no brokenness. Don't you long for that day? Oh, oh, my heart aches for it. And you can see the aching and the longing in this world, right? I, we, we talk about the difficulties in the United States election or whatever, but, and we talk about anti-mask protests, and we talk about all kinds of difficulties. And, and what I hear When I hear all those things, one of the things I hear is an ache. An ache. This world is not as it should be. It's not what it should be. When will it be right? Brothers and sisters, we have that hope. We have that hope to give to the whole world. We do not need to languish in hopelessness forever. Instead, we can grab hold of the hope that someday the dwelling of God will be with us. The dead in Christ will be raised. We will meet the Lord in the air and all things will be recreated. And do you know what? The truth is, is that bringing that message to people right now in both what we say and what we do is part of spreading the kingdom of God even now. We share the redemption of Christ with our neighbors as we live and walk with them in love and share the hope that things don't have to be this way. This is Paul's message to the Thessalonians. That they can have hope. That though they are living in great trials, and though they have, they have, they've persevered already, they can continue on in their perseverance and never lose hope because they know that their hope is strong and sure. And that no matter what troubles they face now, 
they will be made whole and made so that they may live with Christ forever. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for the message of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Thank you so much that we, we who are here and, and those of us who have passed away, when you come again, you will raise us from the dead. Thank you so much that you will make all things new and that you will make all things right. That justice and righteousness and mercy and holiness, that all of those things will be made one in love. Father, guide us, we pray. That we may share that hope with all our neighbors. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to um, we are going to have the song soon and very soon um, as our song of response. And so I would invite you. This would be extremely tough for my father-in-law. This is one of his favorite songs ever, um, and he loves to sing it with great enthusiasm. So I'm going to uh, invite you to stand and sing with curbed enthusiasm, or <laughs> lots of enthusiasm in your heart, but not so much in your voice. You so clap. what's that? Think you clap. can clap. Yes, absolutely. Soon and very soon, let us stand. I was sharing.